Okay, so how's everybody doing? So, time for some fun, right? The farmhouse, the abandoned farmhouse. So, so far on River Road, I've built uh, five or six buildings, all scratch build. Um, of fun but they do take a lot out of you you know there's a sort of a compounding effect where you sort of need a break now and again and I think that no matter what this the subject matter is for or any modeler needs to build for fun sometimes like I mean just fun like just just build something that's non-competitive that just where you can just express yourself and have fun and I'm going to use this little kit here I'll show you where uh, I want to put this little abandoned farmhouse Okay, so it's going to be tucked back. I'll trim the trees back a bit or shift them, have a limb hanging over the roof. And this is going to be this weathered gray house like this. And the kit that I'm going to start with is this one right here, which is um, still still available uh, at your local hobby shop. You know, if you can get it from your local brick and mortar shop, then I encourage you to do that. Just show them your support. Uh, this is number 20600. It's a DPM kit. So hashtag no sponsor. Uh, I'm not sponsored by DPM. I just picked this kit up on a whim, like what we all do when we go to the hobby shop. And I thought it would be a good little subject. Now, what I'm going to do with this, I'm not going to model it like this period around when it was built. It's, it's going to probably built in the 20s, right? Or so, like in my situation on River Road. So... This is the kit here, and I'm going to build it so it looks kind of like this, okay? Okay, so now we're going to add some wooden eaves. They can be metal too, but in this case, they were probably wood unless they were replaced later on. I'm going to use number 261. See the little symbol there? It shows you the shape of the piece, okay? And there it is there. This will be appropriate for that. And what I did was I put a little bit of a bend in it, okay? Now, when you're going to bend this kind of uh, material, it always helps to wrap it around a larger diameter piece. I find if you put it, lay it on like this on your knife on a round piece, tube or rod and just put your thumb on there so your body heat like evergreen is really nice when it's got room temperature and you add a little bit of warmth from your hands and I noticed that this is why I love evergreen it's just you can shape it and bend it and it won't break 
I mean, you might break a few at first, but you get really good at it after a while, and you can just, you know, shape parts. So that's what I'm going to do. And generally, I like to just give it a little bit of a rub just to knock the sheen off it. And then I'm going to basically add this to the bottom of the roof in here like this. Pull that in just a bit. There we go. Okay. Okay, so you can see I've been uh, adding some details here, just random. Just got it all out in front of me here and just playing around, having fun, boarding up some of these windows. And what I'm using there is. Uh, Number 104 10 by 80 thou, which makes a nice plank, a nice sort of 2 by 10 size plank, roughly, and then 40 thou rod for a downpipe for the eave, which uh, you can see here I just made a small piece. And what I'm going to do is I drilled a hole in the eave there. So I'm just going to take that, nothing fancy. Just want to suggest a down pipe, stick it in there. And then I'm going to anchor it to the side of the... So you'll notice that I described this with a fine tooth razor saw, describe in some lines and grain into this plastic and then I'm going to cut these planks and then they're going to be glued over this plate here which is the deck, the porch deck. I just drilled some large holes with a regular drill bit, just a rough hole in here. It doesn't have to be measured, just I'm not going to worry about that, I'm going to plank it over and then I'm just going to poke through here a couple, push a couple planks up just to make them look like they're, or knock them down through like that, just to make it look like there's some rot and decay there. It's just an impression, like this building is not like really dimensional, like this part, like the dimensions aren't important to me. I just want an image. It's in the background. You won't really see any of this. Like you'll just see a bit of an indication with a maybe maybe you'll see the rotted porch with the roof collapsed. That's it. And if you use some small little dimensional pieces, nothing fancy, just to suggest, like just like a painting, right? Uh, if you look at a painting, an old classic painting, you know, with a landscape, but the buildings that are way in the background, they're not detailed. Like, why do they need to be? Right? But the impression is still there. The imagination fills in the rest. 
So that's why I do that with these kind of buildings, even though this building is, you know, a fairly detailed kit to begin with. Um, and, you, and you could put it in the foreground. It would look probably pretty good as well. So that's why. Like this roof piece, just to, I don't know if I mentioned this, but see how crooked these are, these uh, stringers are, or studs, whatever you want to call them. I, I did that on purpose. Like I didn't measure it when I built it. Like whenever you're modeling decay, disrepair, damage, it's, it's, it's a bit of an art in itself. And the art is to be sloppy. Be sloppy about it. <laughs> and once again, that's what makes it fun, right? Like you're not hogtied to incremental measurements and, and fiddling about. I just built this on a piece of parchment paper and uh, I'm probably going to break it a bit more when it goes in. I just once I decide what I'll do with this roof, maybe it's just more of a lean to probably with some tar paper on it or something. So gluing these planks down, I don't really care um, about how accurate they are or if they're even all glued down because I'm going to pull some of them up. So I just want to anchor them in place. Because I know roughly the angle and the height of this building, like it's not, like you're not going to be able to scrutinize it easily because it's going to be back in the trees. And uh, I want a suggestion. You know, the power of suggestion is a, a profound thing when we view things visually, like artistically. Um, you know, we don't even realize how much the imagination fills in until we go back and, and uh, review, like a painting, for example, over and over again. And if you study it and critique it, you begin to realize that there's not as much to it as you as you first realized, right? Or thought. But uh, building uh, disrepair, damage, things like that is a lot of fun because it's really f like a free creative process, and you're not hogtied by, um, you know, plans or increments, right? You're just building off a few photos in your imagination. So if you want to build some sheets of plywood, scale like an HO scale, you use your scale ruler. This is 15 thou, I think. You can use 10 as well. Depends on the thickness of the plywood, right? And besides, when you're talking about half an inch and three quarter of an inch in HO scale, it doesn't really matter. You can make it matter, but you don't have to. So here's four feet wide by eight foot. So four by eight. Ra razor knife. Just scribe it randomly back and forth and do both sides. Every model is just a practice to uh, move into the next one anyway. Like nobody arrives. You know, we all just keep getting better and better as we model and practice. We keep getting rewarded. So you can scribe in knot holes if you want to with the end of a number 11 blade, I find. And they'll show, like, after you paint them a, a light color, like a plywood kind of color, let's say, or something. And then you just put a raw umber wash on. I always say raw umber because it's usually a default wash color that makes just about anything look good. And, uh, you know, I think, 
I think some of this one of these pieces of plywood should be broken a bit or so here's the way you can break Plastic makes unbelievable wood looking wood uh, if you learn to just apply a few simple washes to it. If you just learn the process of just a basic, well, depending on the color and the shade of the wood, but if you paint it light gray and then put a wash of raw umber on it, that's the, a good place to start. And you can change up the color. You put it, do that piece, it's going to look like a sheet of wood. It's just that if you're working in, in wood all the time, you never do use plastic. You, you're just biased. Wood, nothing better to model wood, rather wood, not true. Because when you get to smaller scales, it, it, it doesn't translate as well as a modeled piece of plastic. There are people, uh, you know, this is subject to opinion, but there are people that I've seen people model wood in plastic that'll just blow your mind. It looks better than wood than real wood because it doesn't have that fuzzy you know it's big grain look to it right when you can instill or carve in or sculpt in super fine texture with tools you got to model a little bit more maybe because it's 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 not there initially but it's like if you're going to do metal steel, you, you wouldn't use wood, you use plastic. And you can use, uh, I've already shown with the diner model that you can model cement easily with plastic as well. Okay, so just to finish this off then, as I found a little piece of my scrap box of some uh, railing from, uh, I think it was some uh, wrought iron fence, I just nibbled off, just left the top rail and just cut with a, a long blade the railing away and just left a little bit like a little mini ladder and just, just to suggest that Victorian kind of lattice uh, crown style that they had along the... Uh, edge of a porch roof like that this here would have been is long gone so the corner just a little suggestion of it it's almost ready for paint so what i'm going to do here is i'm just going to cut in I just want to say about this airbrush, like I bought a new airbrush, like I have more airbrushes than I need really, but every airbrush is different, every person is different, but this is just my old uh, Vega siphon feed, I love this thing, I, I, I have thousands of miles on this from back in my uh, museum days, it was my backup, so I didn't put much time on it, I used my Omni 5000 mostly with, with some of my other Iwatas and stuff, but uh, I love this airbrush. It just, you got to go with what you feel comfortable with. And of course, you'll never know unless you try different types of airbrushes, right? So, um, but I just love it. It's quick, easy. It's, it's really well balanced. It has a really, like if I showed you the tip on this, you wouldn't believe it, how fat it is. And uh, I love it. You know, I can cut small lines if I want to with it. Um, but it's just my go-to, you know, airbrush uh, i was using the uh, newer one that i bought the uh, pache talon it's just taking a little bit of getting used to i'm not used to the feel and the weight of it and stuff and uh you know like this one here like i like the cup down here i can rest my thumb against it and my finger i just it just feels nice in my in my hand i really like it um so you can see i'm just going to get up in there under the rafters there uh, anywhere where it might be dark uh, you can paint the inside too uh, if you want uh, you don't really have to in this case but I uh, just want to get in under the eaves there 
maybe a little bit inside the windows there. Nothing too fancy. And then what I'm going to do is, is uh, I'm going to uh, overspray it with some buff. Okay. This buff here I made up out of, uh, or I made two bottles out of one. Just clean, the, clean your dirty ones in isopropyl and split the pigment up over two bottles, even three sometimes, but in this case I just did two. So uh, I'm just gonna just gonna shoot this down. Because I'm going to be using some, uh, you know, Vallejo. I'm going to be doing mostly brushwork here. It's just some base coats uh, that can show through or I can work on top of. You know, the nice thing about doing this too is you learn stuff as you're doing it. Like, you know, like you learn that, wow, look at that fascia, the grain on the wood there. Just a couple of shots of buff over the dark brown. Like you learn as you go, right? Like try to see it that way. Like don't, don't get hung up on, oh, I'm not ready, you know. Yes, you are. Like as soon as you get your airbrush and, and some thin paint, you're ready. You just start painting. Start having fun. Start making mistakes. Start learning as you go. I'm still learning stuff. You know, I had fun painting a vehicle the other day quick. It took you know, about an hour and a half and I didn't tape it. I just wanted to have fun for an hour and I plugged in. And, uh, you know, I learned some new things, you know. I learned certain colors, like, okay, so here, so there's the dark brown, like, oops, sorry, uh, how can I show that better? Let's see if this light here. So notice the dark brown and then just the buff over top, like, see that? I mean, that's almost pa passable from a distance already. It just, it took nothing to do it, right? Okay. See, I got to fix this but see the shadow the artificial shadow under the eaves okay so second thoughts <laughs> remember how i talked about the airbrush you can go crazy with it okay look um when you get into airbrushing, you realize how powerful a tool they really are. Um, they're just, they can make short work of any model, believe me. Um, now, depending on what you're painting, right? Like if you're doing scenery and sort of, you know, weathered buildings and stuff like that, you can really cut your time short. Not to be in a hurry, but just to, to save you a lot of time you can spend on another model. like. Um, but you know, there's no one way of doing things like, how can I explain this? So, so when I paint a model, I'm not worried about overspray. Okay. Because I can cut that away with a brush later. I can come in here with a wash and just melt that away, you know? Um, so that's why I don't worry about it. Like I want soft edges everywhere. That's the advantage of an airbrush. I'm going to put in some hints of red here because, uh, it was a red farmhouse. So, and there's a little bit of flesh on here as well. I just sprayed just prior to this just to help add a little bit of fade. Uh, I find if you try to fade paint right off the bat, it goes on pink. It looks pink here now, but when you put a wash on it, it won't look the same. And then you can pick off some of the clapboard with some brighter red with a brush. So I'm just going to fade out some of this with red, like just blend some in. 
And this is a really fat tip, right? You can see how if you get in close, you can still cut, cut tight. You know, the airbrush too, it does a lot of the blending for you, especially with acrylics. And then, if you work in uh, oil washes over top, it looks even better. Okay, so um, I just want to show you here. So I'm using two colors over top of the initial Tamiya oversprays, right? Like that's what it looks like. That's how it starts off. But I wet it down like this. And I put the wash on. Put this burnt umber. Just work one side of the house at a time. Don't worry about the other sides. You'll learn something on this side that you might want to apply on the other side. And the sides that I'm going to see are these sides. So we start on the back to get warmed up, right? Okay. And the two colors I'm going to use is this 71.083 orange and this 71.085 Ferrari red. Now I'm going to pick out clapboard planks. And the reason why I like to use orange is because orange makes the best faded red, in my opinion. I mean, if you introduce orange. If you try to introduce white to red, what happens? It goes pink. If you want to uh, get a, uh, what I would call a more effective faded, excuse me, <clears throat> red, uh, just brush a little orange over top of it. And you'll see what I mean. It almost highlights the plank, but it also suggests a kind of a fade as well. You can see the upper ones that have the gray, white. And what I'll do there is, is I'll just add it like a wash of a bit of orange and a little bit of red. Now remember, uh, if you get too much paint or whatever, just come back, clean your brush quick and just come back and just rinse it down and just feather it out like that, see? Okay, don't worry if it goes into the clapboard as a sort of pin wash because that's just a reflection of the plank, right? Okay. Notice this lid too, how it's got a trough around it. That's where I put my water and it stays. I bring water up from the, from the trough or from the little canal here up onto the pallet as I need it. A 
I'll show you what this burnt umber will do to this little galvanized plate for this little uh, fireplace guard plate or whatever. So if that's a bit too dark, I wash my brush in a separate jar, by the way. I don't bring a dirty brush onto this palette if I can help it. And I reset my palette all the time I just from the sink. Wipe it down clean. So you can add water and just lift some of that off while it's still wet. You can still work it, see? And then I can go like this. See what happens when there's no water? It just builds up spots, right? Watch when I add water what it does. See how it thins it out and it runs. Capillaries into everything. See these light shingles? Watch that was when I put a wash over those. See it tones them down, right? It's all staining really is what it is. It's just stain painting. This plywood here with all the scribing on it from the razor saw. And you let it dry and it changes, right? Uh, see some of these planks here? I want to bring in a little bit of light. Sorry, I only have so much room in the aperture here. Um, otherwise, I've got to zoom way back and you can't see it. So you can't always have your cake and eat it too when you're trying to cover this. So see this plank here? I'm going to drag some light gray across it. And not the one beside it, but the next one maybe. I like to alter like that. Just deceives the viewer, you know, that they're different. When in fact they're not really. It's just a color change. Okay. See how one color shift, one stain can change everything, right? Watch how I start doing on the shingles on the tiles, watch. And as you're stain painting, you can add more pigment or less water and then graduate up your strength of paint. If you start getting out of hand, just bring more water into the equation. Don't be afraid to stab a color onto another color uh, and then say, well, no, I don't want that and just wipe it off. But leave the residual stain there. It's not going to hurt it. And say, no, I want to try some of this darker here. Along this top edge. And then I want to try some down here. Lay on a heavy piece like that. Come in with water and just flood into it. Leave some of the stronger parts and some of the lighter parts. But make sure you use lots of water to keep the edge soft. To soften any tide marks that you don't want. Okay. Now, that's a kind of a red brown, right? Now watch what happens when I use this dark brown. Watch how different it is. You can wet it down. Pre wet, use a bigger brush, but I won't right now. Too lazy. I'm going to show you what gray looks like, too. 
Now watch. See the difference? Okay, let's take some dark sea gray. You can stab straight pigment in too and then add water on the model. You don't have to thin it on the palette all the time. See there? It's got a cooler, right? Cooler shade, isn't it? Which I like right now. So I'm just going to go over top of this brown. Yeah, throw a bit of white in there, see what happens, just to lighten it down. Water is your saving grace in this type of painting. It covers a multitude of sins. See that? See how that roof changed just like that compared to this one? Well, how do I fix this? Well, you just go right over top of it. As long as you keep the paint wet, you can keep working it. But let's uh, let's correct that. Let that paint flow right down into the eave too, as well. The eave will be dark inside of there. See. See how that changes things? A gray wash changes the whole look and equation, doesn't it? See, there's just picked out tiles. You got to do a little bit more work on this side, and then I'll just put a gray wash over it. So you don't really have to use oils, even though I recommend you try oils as well because they have a look. Oils have, I've mentioned, sort of have a beautiful, rich transparency to them, and the pigments are awesome. What it'll do, it'll take the model to even another level in some cases. But you can achieve remarkable results with just water-based acrylics that are fast drying. I mean, you can literally, uh, like, this is almost dry already. Oh, and let me just say one thing in closing before uh, I move on. So it's not so much heat on the model that'll dry it fast. Even though people use blow dryers, it's the air, not the heat. Okay, moving air, like a fan. So if you turn a fan on, in your studio and it's blowing over your bench, uh, the paint's going to dry quite a bit uh, faster, okay? So you can work quicker, all right?